three minutes. Three minutes. Okay, so I got 60 minutes to talk here. I'm going to talk about .NET. If you're not sure why you're here, we're going to be talking about .NET 4. I'm very excited to use my, uh, my widescreen projector here for the first time. This is pretty cool. I'm impressed already. Your country has impressed me, and it only took this projector to do it. I'm running, um, I'm just going to fill time here while we get ready to start. Uh, I'm running uh, Windows 7, right? Everybody love Windows 7? Do you guys not think Windows 7 is going to completely revitalize the PC market? Huh? Right? After years of Windows Vista sucking the life out of us, Windows 7 is going to be awesome. One of the things that's really rockin' sweet about what I'm doing on this particular machine is that I'm running uh, a VHD, a virtual hard drive here but I'm not running virtual PC. Have you guys done this before? Okay, so sometimes when I hear people trying to dual boot, uh, it's, it's almost like a geek rite of passage to dual boot your machine. And I think dual booting is a really great way to screw up your computer fast, you know? You know that the guy in your office who says, hey, you know, I've got Windows 7, Windows Vista, Windows 2008, and Linux all triple booting or quadruple booting on the machine at the same time, you know, four days later, yeah, my file system's corrupted. I'm not really sure how it happened. But what I'm doing here is booting off of a VM, but I'm not running a VM. So my hard drive is this file here. So I'm running a build of Windows 7. This is a 40 gig file here. I've got build 7135, right? So it's newer than the, the release, okay? The D drive is my computer's hard drive. Isn't that cool? The C drive is the virtual disk. So it's like dual booting without potentially screwing up your computer, I think. Um, so let's talk about ASP.NET. So uh, these are some of the websites that you can make with ASP.NET, some of the high quality, well-designed, <laughs> and, uh, and thoughtful websites that your grid control and your details control make. We'd really like to be able to make sites like this. So there's some things about ASP.NET that are a little frustrating that you may have dealt with. Uh, one of them is the notion of control IDs is a little frustrating. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about client IDs and routing here. Let me see. Did I hide that slide there? I will show you the demo, and then I'll explain what you're going to see. We've changed a couple of things in Web Forms 4 to make life a little bit easier. On this machine, I'm running Dev 10 Beta 1, and all that stuff earlier I showed about running in a VHD, it's because I didn't want to mess up my existing machine like this. So this was a really nice way to run Dev 10 as fast as I could without um, running in a VM. Oops, my, uh, my battery thing is flashing. Okay, so one of the things that's irritating about uh, .NET uh, for an ASP.NET is that your client IDs get really long, right? You've probably seen these where... Uh, oh, I'm definitely missing some slides. I apologize. What's going on here? Did I hide them? I did hide them. So I'm going to show you two demos here. One is better client IDs and one is uh, intelligent routing for web forms because web forms isn't going away. And routing is something that uh, is important for web forms and for, uh, for MVC. Okay, so let's start with, um, let's do this. Let's start with this example. If we do this little, this is a little application that'll show a list of uh, television shows. And it's going to pull this data out of a provider and put it into a little, um, little Ajaxy list. And then you can, uh, oh, actually movies here. and I can order them around, right? If we do a view source, we've got a, an ordered list, and I want to be able to, to talk to these. I want to give these list items my data binding. I want the ID. In this case, it's coming from my television show or movie provider to be appended. So I'll have control zero underscore and then one, two, three, or whatever. It'll make that predictable. So that ID there is like I'm doing a data binding for, for eval. The object data source is just going to pull those TV shows out, and it's just going to take my shows, and it's going to append that ID. 
So this is just letting you take control of your client IDs. It's been a huge hassle in the past, and now it's not going to be that big of a deal. Let me run that again. I think we're switching between movies and TV shows. There we go. This allows me to use uh, much more logical jQuery code. And in this case here, since we're shipping jQuery, I just got a nice little uh, sortable li div. I can communicate with those, uh, those URL rewriting. But URL rewriting is a one-way thing. This is a way of like making a regular expression of some kind and putting a tool like a URL rewriter on. URL comes in from the client, and it just says, based on this rule, rewrite, and then keep going. So you can make a structure and say, well, slash product slash something is really products.aspx question mark something else. It's a, it's a little hacky, and it's only one way. But a route in MVC and a route inside of um, web forms is actually two-way. You want to be able to say, well, give me a URL that, uh, that looks like this. You want to be able to programmatically say, well, I wish that I used the pretty products route. Here's the inputs, and then create me a URL. You want to have a higher layer of abstraction. Plus, you want to be able to pull the data out of there. In this case here, bikes is data, right? If I hit another thing like breaks, breaks is a bit of data. That's sitting inside of the routes data. I want to be able to get to that. So what we can do, pop up products here. I've got a couple of things. Here I can refer to route values. Here I'm saying route value category. And see how I'm actually referring to it as the word category. I'm not pulling it out of a dictionary uh, with a string category. So somewhere in the system we know about products and categories. And then I'm able to refer to it inside of a query. So here I've got an entity data source. And one of the parameters is a route parameter. So all of the different things that took query string parameters are, can, can also take route parameters. So the notion of a route is a first class thing. And they work just like we're used to them working in MVC. Here we can add a route. I've named it the product route. This is hard coded, this products. That word is hard coded. That could be whatever you wanted. If I made it foo, then I would say slash foo slash bikes. It's this token that is significant. And that's how that route data information knew how to pull out the notion of a category. This also enables us even more to create hybrid applications. Because I think that when MVC came out, a lot of people thought that MVC uh, was going to mark kind of a fork in the road. Like when you started a project, it's like, OK, decide now. You have two choices, web forms over here and MVC over there, and that's it. And once you've made your choice, it's it. Right? It's like coming out of high school, and you could go to university, or you could become a mechanic. And once you become a mechanic, you can never go the other direction. I don't think that that's uh, a very good message. And I think that the, the problem is the file new project dialog box. File new project has this big dramatic list of all the different kinds of projects that you could do. And it doesn't let you understand that you could have hybrids. You could have applications that are part MVC and part web forms. Because ASP.NET proper is so much more than just the angle bracket generator. Right? Web forms is just an angle bracket generator. And MVC is just an angle bracket generator. It just makes HTML. It's just a, a way to, to uh, design your systems. But it doesn't uh, change the way authentication, authorization, um, session state, caching, all the different things that are good about ASP.NET. ASP.NET is greater than web forms. You know that the CodePlex site, you guys are familiar with CodePlex. CodePlex is itself a hybrid application. It's part MVC and part web forms. Because sometimes that's the right thing that you need. Sometimes web forms is correct, and sometimes MVC is correct. And being able to have a hybrid and have shared routes and pretty URLs throughout everything is a really powerful, powerful thing. So I, I hope we do a better job at getting that message out. Because right now, uh, I would have to say I don't think we are. So this runs through ASP.NET routing. And we're going to make that even friendlier. That syntax will be even friendlier. You'll have the notion of a web forms route. You can see that the, re the request comes in. We're pulling out that category name. Here I called it name. And then the route values are available to you inside of your web forms application, just as if they were query strings. So you've got 
form posts, query strings, and also now routes. Makes things a lot cleaner. Now on the JavaScript side, we've got a lot of improvements too. Um, you've probably done data binding like this before. This is server-side data binding, just like we did a moment ago. You bring in some TV shows or some movies, and you say eval. Um, and I think data binding has a little bit of a, of a bad name, which I think is unfortunate, because data binding is just a syntactic sugar over a for loop, right? I don't know why people pick on it so much. But a server-side data binding looks like this. We've got client-side data binding. So this would mean that rather than the data being manipulated and brought together in the HTML on the server side, that's going to happen on the client. And if you're consuming JSON, JavaScript object notation, you're bringing that JSON over. This is a really convenient way to bring, uh, bring those tables together. And what's nice about it is you don't necessarily have to do string concatenation, which is dangerous. If you are finding yourself taking data apart on the client and assembling HTML, it's dangerous. You can have injection attacks and all sorts of stuff, and Phil and I are going to talk about that in the, uh, the Ha Ha Show at 4 o'clock. Phil Hack and Scott Hansman talking about uh, security. And uh, this syntax, this curly bracket, double curly bracket syntax for client side is really actually very easy. The idea is that the client, your web browser, makes some request, and it can pull the data from all over. It doesn't just have to be JSON, but you can pull the data from Azimex or from WCF. Uh, in the example that I'm going to show you, I'm going to use ADO.NET Data Services. And I'll talk about that tomorrow afternoon, what used to be called Astoria. The JSON data comes back, and it's being maintained on the client side by this data context. And you can maybe modify the data if you wanted to, save it back. And uh, all that binding is being happened by some very simple uh, JavaScript. And I'm going to show you this because you don't even actually technically require ASP.NET to do it. You can do it um, with a static file. This is a good example of uh, how we're, we're, we're trying to do more things uh, in a standard way that don't require uh, you know, ASP.NET. A lot of the people don't realize that the MS Ajax JavaScript uh, is something that you can do without ASP.NET itself. So in the example here, I'm just going to use an HTM. This is not ASP.NET that's doing this. It's just a static text file, right? There's no server-side magic. Just want to make that point. I've got a service here, customer service. This is an Astoria service, and this will return JSON. Okay, it's going to return some JavaScript object notation. And down in here, I've got some scripts. We got jQuery, just because I like jQuery. Uh, we've got the MX, MS Ajax and then the ADO.NET stuff. Now, this is poorly named, again, like all things Microsoft with a crappy name. Uh, it's not ADO.NET at all. People don't realize that the ADO.NET data services stuff, while run by the SQL team, is very much focused on standards like Atom and like JSON. Okay? But they decided to call it ADO.NET data services as opposed to calling it uh, what I thought they should have called it, which would be uh, Astoria. It's a good, good unique name, and it's easy to Google for. Um, and then we've got this default.js. That's the only script that I had to write. So let's look at our page first. And then we'll look at our default JS. In this case here, we're going to bring back some customers. And I'm annotating the HTML. I've added a little name. Because this is XHTML, I'm adding some additional namespaces here. Just some annotations. And then notice here we've got customers template. Customers plural. And then we've got customer here. So we've got a master detail relationship that we're going to set up here. I can even put within my binding expressions kind of little bits of JavaScript for evaluation. Here I'm saying that if it's an odd number, then put the CSS class odd there. That way I can have that nice alternating colors that you would get on a table. And it's OK that I'm using a table too, right? Why is it OK that I'm using a table? Such a quiet, quiet European audience. Um, Sometimes the, the um, CSS people, the CSS Nazis, will come out and say, you should use an LI. You should use div, div and LI. Like, those are the only allowed tags in all of CSS, right? It's like div class something, UL and LI. Why is it OK I'm using a table? Because it's tabular data. Seems, seems a, little, uh, a little reasonable to me, but you never know when you're going to get in trouble for using a table. Since it was a table of data, I thought that this was actually a useful, uh, a useful tag to use. 
Here I can say, bind in this information. It's going to bind at this level. Because I set that level as a sys template, this is where that data is going to bind. So the for loop there is kind of implied, isn't it? We're going to have table rows multiple times doing a select. This concatenation here is running within the context of my, uh, my client-side data template. So appropriate escaping of things is happening here. If someone tried to tunnel JavaScript inside of like the first name object or the last name object, I would still be safe. This is different than if you did those yourself, if you concatenated strings together yourself. Here we're adding first name and surname together. On the client side, all we had to do to make this happen was this JavaScript here. And I'll show you a way to do it actually with no JavaScript at all. But I want to give some examples. This is like technically six lines, but a lot of times in JavaScript, you'll break stuff up so that that's one line because it's been broken up onto multiple lines. So here we're going to create a data context, and we're going to point it to the customer service. Remember, this is client-side code. This is an HTM file. It's not ASP.NET, and we're just using JavaScript. So you could use this client-side templates in your Python apps or your Ruby apps if it makes you happy. Then we're going to say, grab me the top 20, order them by first name, and when you're getting those customers, also expand out to orders. Okay? The selected item should get a CSS class of selected. That's the customers, plural. Singular is going to be here. And then we'll bind them together. We're going to create this binding between the source of customers and the target of customer because there's this master detail relationship. And then we'll use jQuery to hook up a, a live event to the update button. So then any changes that I make will be sent back automatically, again, using JSON. Now, in order to see this correctly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up Fiddler. If you haven't used Fiddler, you should. It's a fantastic tool for editing stuff like this. And this is going to listen to the traffic that we're going to do here. And I'm going to fire up my... Uh, application. But because it's on local host, uh, Fiddler won't be able to hear it. So instead, we'll say, I think it's ipv4.fiddler. Yeah. And that'll route the traffic through Fiddler. I'm going to do a refresh here, and I want you to watch what happens. You see there's a flash there? For a moment, there's just the top part of the table. And then the data shows up. That's because the page itself just has that top row. Then the JavaScript fires. It goes off to the server. It brings it back, and then it does the data binding. So the page, the page looks like that, and then the data comes back. And now I can click around, and you see on the right-hand side there, that's our master detail. So this is the customer template. We go over to Fiddler, see what's going on here. Here is the call to the customer service. Let me zoom in, and we can see what's going on. This is just a regular HTTP GET, and I'm going to talk in detail about this in the Astoria talk. You can see I've got my query there, top 20, ordered by first name, right? And there's the data coming back as JSON. We've got lots of this data. That JSON data is really easy to manipulate on the client side, and you may have done this yourself when, you, when you're writing JSON code like this. And in this case, Using the templates, we're automatically generating this table. We did the, the odd, even and odd stuff. But the interesting part, if I clear out Fiddler, come in here, we'll give this guy a middle name, and hit Update. We can see here that using, again, only client-side code, using only standard JavaScript that works in any browser, we just did a post batching up that data, and we passed it that, that diff gram. We could actually change multiple things. The change tracking about what row changed is actually built into the JavaScript. And then that gets sent back to the, the server, which then did the work of updating the database, which I think is pretty cool, all being done in just an HTM file. I did it like that just so you could see how much you can get done without using ASP.NET. Now you add in either web forums or MVC, and things start getting really, really interesting. Changing those templates 
is then a very declarative uh, operation. Because in here, there's no JavaScript. There's just a declaration of how I want things to look. Changing these templates is really easy. That's even something that you could give to a designer. You could just say, well, go ahead and lay this out, and here are the potential fields that you might want to put in there. Or even you know, default values like, you know, this person has no title. Okay? But that still required me to write this little bit of, of JavaScript. You can go uh, even more uh, over the top and do it entirely declarative. This actually involves moving all of the, the declarations that were in that default.javascript file and moving them out into those namespaces within the HTML itself. So the location of the service of customers.service is now in here. There's no JavaScript in this file now that I had to write, just the libraries that I imported. Those declarations before, they showed up here. You have a choice. You can use it any way that you want. You don't have to do it this way. If you like it one way, uh, do what makes you happy. But here we added those data view operations, so then everything is done entirely, entirely uh, declaratively. And I'll bring that one up run that. Boom, same thing. So this JavaScript library is something that's being added and, and, and all of the things that we just saw there is being added in 4.0. There's some previews that you can look at now on CodePlex, so you can play with this stuff today. But I think that that's a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool add-on to uh, ASP.NET 4. And you know the thing that just kills me as someone who's only worked at Microsoft for about a year and a half is that the technology is so cool. What we're doing wrong is we're, you know, we're presenting it to you in, in ways that are not, um, not holistic. We're not showing you how the big picture fits together. You'll end up meeting like, you know, the PM who works on this one thing, and he'll give a talk, and he'll think that that technology is the greatest thing in the history of the world. But he has no idea of how it works with other things. And that's why I'm trying to show things that are working together. The idea that this JavaScript is talking to Astoria, and then this could be then used in MVC. I think Microsoft could do a lot better job of presenting to you that there are these building blocks that are really a lot simpler than we think that they are. And the goal here is to, um, to go home early, right? I don't know about you guys, but I love to tell my boss that it'll take eight hours and then leave at noon and work from home. You know, sometimes you guys feel like it's this kind of thing. I don't know if you remember you know, how these are. It's like, you know, push a button, and then the, the ball falls down, and then knocks this thing over, and then da 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 Sometimes people feel like Microsoft talk technology is like that. Uh, I think we're starting to really get it right. We're making it a lot simpler and a lot more lightweight, and I hope that you appreciate that too. Um, okay, so more, more uh, .NET 4 stuff. We'll, talk, we'll switch over to the client side. So WPF4 includes a number of new things, mostly focused on Windows 7 and multi-touch, but also the addition of uh, a data grid, which is uh, about time. only took four versions, right? I always tease the WPF4 guys because now you can do all the stuff you could do in Visual Basic 6, except now you only need a gig of video RAM and you do the whole thing with angle brackets. Except, well, you can make it 3D and glow, so that's good. I think I've created a lot of these green and purple applications in my, in my years. It always seems like the first application someone makes in Visual Basic is green and purple. I don't know why. So let's look at how WPF uses a thing called MEF. You know, Glenn Block is here. Glenn Block is the program manager for the Managed Extensibility Framework. And this is something that is a formalized plug-in model that makes uh, making your application extensible so much easier than, uh, than before. Uh, has anyone ever written their own plugin manager where you have to go and say, make an interface, I foo, and then you have to go and say, for each assembly in the current folder, load up the thing, if it's an I foo, da, 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 da. It's right, it's the same thing over and over again. It's a hassle. And it also forces you to uh, be really explicit about where you want your plugins to be and how you want them to behave. It makes making extensible applications difficult. MEF is really focused on trying to make things just plug it in easy, just USB easy. It uh, wants you to have your applications open for extension but closed for modification. You want to make it so someone can have appropriate and reasonable extensible points within your app so they can change it in ways that maybe you hadn't thought of without modifying kind of the fundamentals of how your app works. It, it wants you to, to allow the unknown and think about what, what is known and what is unknown to, to allow the, um, the, the end user 
in this case the end user developer, to make a change in your application that maybe you didn't expect. So this is a really cool um, application in WPF that a, a guy named Jason Olson worked on. And uh, I thought that it was, it was just too good to not show. It's an automotive application, which I think is kind of ironic because I think four or five of these car companies have gone out of business since the last time that I showed uh, this demo. So feel good about that. I had another application a while back that was banks. Uh, so I can't win, really. I can't pick an industry that America won't eventually destroy. Uh, okay, so this is just a, a WPF application that's going to pop up a list of queries. He calls it the, uh, the cache maker. And I'm going to run this application, and uh, it's going to show a, a series of queries, and they're going to run uh, sequentially, one after the other. So here it pops up. You see the yellow there? The queries are running. We've got Fiat, Ford Fiestas, Beamers, Lotus, Bentleys, and Audis. So there's a big, long-running process there. Several hundred thousand different kinds of cars have been loaded there. There was a progress bar, and we've got a nice data grid. This is the new 4.0 data grid, and it does all the things that one would expect a, a good data grid to do, like sorting and all sorts of fun stuff and, and virtualization. But what I think is interesting is what's going on up here. Here we're, we're loading. You see the, see the yellow? I'll do that again. The yellow is going boom, 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 boom. It's running those queries. It took about 2.5 seconds to, to run those queries. We'll, uh, we'll come back to that and see why that's significant. But remember, 2.4, 2.5 seconds to run that. These are car queries. So if I open up my application here, we've got this iCar query interface. And this was just uh, a, a formalization of those little blocks to say, well, you know, I don't want to just hard code that I know about Ford, so I'll make a, an interface called iCarQuery with things like the status of the query and the list of the cars that have come back. It's a pretty basic kind of a thing. Then we can come down here and we have different implementations. So here's the Ford Fiesta query. This is the interesting part. This is MEF saying, I have a... I have an iCar query. I export it. I make it available to the world. It's just an attribute. Just say, yep, this is what I have. This is what I have available. So we're saying export. Let's go back over to our application here, our cash maker application. This line here is the, the main window of this application, the cash maker application. And he says, import. I need a. He needs an observable collection of car queries. Observable collections are really cool. These are collections in WPF that everyone can observe and be notified about when they change. This basically means when you add something into that collection, everyone just sees that it happened and they get the updated collection. They're really nice. It's, it's, a, it's like a list that has some thread safety to it and the ability to subscribe to notifications about that list changing. And they're really great to bind to. So here he just says, hey, I got a list of car queries. Import. So we have a whole series of queries, Audi, Beamer, Bentley, all exporting car query. And he says, well, I need them. But nowhere else in here, in this, in this window, does he say where he's going to get them. It's just a declaration. The system handles the composition. And this is the, going to be the standard way to do this, so much so that MEF is built into system.componentModel. In there, in the composition namespace, this is something that you've got built into .NET 4. So you can use this anywhere. It has nothing to do with WPF or ASP.NET. It's part of system. Because I really believe you can learn a lot from a namespace. And when Microsoft puts something under system, that means that they're serious and it's not going anywhere. So, so feel good about that. So this is the startup of the app. And MEF is going to say, well, look in the current directory. See that directory catalog dot. And I'm going to need a, 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 a composite container. I'm going to put all of this stuff together and I'm going to say, do it. I'm going to say, compose these. And just by virtue of the fact that I've said, well, here's where we're going to look. Look in the current directory. All of those car queries are going to get automatically instantiated and put into that observable collection and handed off to the application. So the plug-in model in this case was just make, a, uh, make an interface and tell me where to look for more. 
And you can extend these. This directory catalog, you can make other ones. You could make a catalog that found the DLLs in SQL Server, and when you downloaded them off the web, or looked in other folders, or whatever. All these different parts of MEF are themselves extensible. So what's significant about this is that maybe I want to add a new car here. Maybe I want to, let's go ahead and right click and open this folder. Here's my bin debug. And I'm going to, uh, you, uh, let me see, I'll probably go down here. We made another one for Ferraris. So here's another assembly, totally different assembly, separate from the other cars. And he is also an iCar query. And all he has to do in this case is just reference that, that one common place where the interfaces are coming from. You guys with me so far? You're so polite. If I was in America or in the South, somebody would have called bullshit at some point. It would be interesting to see which is the first of you to call bullshit. So now I can use this wonderful Windows 7 feature where I go and shove this up against the left and shove this up against the right because I've been looking for a reason to do that. Isn't that cool? Let's do that again. That's just fun. Oops. And I'll just drag the Ferrari stuff over here and then run the application again. And Ferrari's just appeared right there. And he's participating in this experience with the rest of the applications, with the rest of the plugins, rather. And we do this sequentially. Now, this is another thing that I want to show you. We do this sequentially. It took 2.9 in that instance there. That's that S in the upper left corner. Find them sequentially. One of the other things that's built into system dot something good is uh, parallelism. So I'm going to hit the P button. And now, you see what just happened there? Remember that yellow, kind of subtle yellow thing I've been asking you guys to watch for? Running, 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 running. Dot, dot. See it kind of walking its way across there? Do it in parallel. See they're happening multiple times? I'm getting a 1.7x speed up, almost 2x. This machine is a dual proc. So I'm using two cores there. Let's see if we can see it happen. Here's my Contoso application, parallel. Yep, see how it's using 100% of the CPU for just a moment? as opposed to the sequential, which can only use 50%, because it can only use one of my two CPUs. That's because the kind of query that I was doing is simple enough that parallelism is really uh, easy. All we're doing is using the parallel task libraries here and saying, rather than for each, I'm saying parallel for each. Because the queries are independent of each other. They can be running. They don't have to synchronize in any way. And this is, this is really common. Most of the for loops that you write involve a for loop over something basic. And you just if you could split it out, you would. Why don't you do it? It's because threading is a hassle. right? It's just a hassle. It's, it's not that you can't conceive of it. It's that you just can't bust out the code without looking on, you know, on, the web, on a website to figure out how to do it. Concurrency is hard. But if you could just say parallel for each and then run the queries, you can do that. As opposed to the standard for each, which is just this. That parallelism has been baked into uh, .NET. And I'll show you some more examples here. We'll talk about it. The idea of this kind of overall initiative is to focus on the business and not the issue of concurrency. We can all conceive of the threading, but it's hard to get it right on the first try. It's concurrency for the masses, right? It's concurrency for the folks that didn't come to this conference, right? Not the alpha geeks, but the, the beta geeks back at, back at the office. The, the, the example that I, that I like to give is that if it's hard to thread, in this case, thread a needle, redesign the needle. This is actually an actual design for a needle where someone pushes down and the needle splits open to make it really big. You put the thread in and then it closes back up again. I thought that's such a great metaphor for a problem. Just completely reframe the issue if threading a needle is difficult. So in .NET 4, you've got this parallel library for tasks as well as plink, which lets you make your link queries parallel really, really easily. And then a number of different improvements to system.threading. 
So for example, if you have some existing link and you just want to say, I wish this were parallel, you can just say as parallel and it gets faster. And you can say, well, I only want to use half of the CPUs on the machine if you don't want to use all of them. Let's say you had a quad proc machine. And this will scale very nicely. You saw that you're not 2x, but we got 1.7 something x. You get that. It's, it's kind of typical performance that you would expect from multi-threaded code because the act of coordinating involves some, uh, some CPU. I'll give you another example here uh, of some parallelism. This is an application to look at baby names. One using link and one using plink. Let's make it uh, 10 meg input size. I don't want to use too much time here. I've got a bar down at the bottom here about how many processors I want to use. In this case, I've only got two procs, so I can switch back and forth between one and two. That processor thing would become wider if I had more procs on this machine. So doing link over this is 0.82 seconds, and doing p-link over the same thing gives me almost 2x speed up. Let's make it 50 megabyte set. So we're generating a 50 megabyte list of baby names and what names are common and what names are, and I want to see how often the name Robert appears in the state of Washington. So we're doing 3.7 seconds, 2.21 seconds. So you're getting 1.5 to 1.8, depending on what you're doing. And it's really, really easy to write this kind of code. It's very declarative. It really is concurrency for the masses. So definitely check that out. That's baked in. Now, there are, there are P-Link demos that you can play with now. You may notice that a lot of the stuff that you're seeing in 4.0 that's getting baked into system dot whatever are things that you may have seen before in, um, in beta form or you've seen blogged about. I think that you could probably agree that Microsoft's doing a lot more openness, a lot more blogging. Like MEF itself, the extensibility thing that we saw, that's released as open source. So it's MSPL, and if you don't like it, you could you potentially change it and do something else with it. Now, the DLR and the notion of being dynamic is also built into .NET 4, which is really cool, which allows you to use things like Python and Ruby, and I think there's something like 19 or 20 other small uh, dynamic languages that are being set up. Uh, the dynamic language runtime is an explicit layer that sits on top of the CLR that enables this, uh, this dynamism, is that a word? Dynamism? Dynamicness? Something like that. The thing that the DLR provides are expression trees, like the, the co compilation of these uh, languages, the dispatching of the call when you type in object.method, that's called method dispatch. Being able to do that dynamically is really interesting. Being able to hook it up to things like Python and Ruby are, are obvious, but you may think, well, why do I really care about that? Well, there's other dynamic or late-bound languages that you might care about, like Office or like COM itself. If you've ever written COM interop code talking to, to Word, uh, it's a huge hassle. It's a huge hassle. It's like using reflection. Reflection itself would be an example of being dynamic. Wouldn't it be nice if you could write reflection-style code that didn't look like reflection. So there's a number of different binders. One, in fact, is the .NET binder, which is kind of like reflection, and I'll show you what this looks like. Using the DLR in an application is really, really easy. And if, would, if it was hard, it wouldn't be worth bothering with. Let's go down here and take a look at how we can call Python. I've got a library here called random.py, and I'm going to call that random library. Here in, the, in my lib folder, I've got all this Python stuff. Any Python people here? It's a really confusing language. It really is, seriously. Look, see how confusing that is? <laughs> seriously, you can't tell me that this is easy. This guy's actually quoting books and listing page numbers of what he did. This is advanced math that I have not, uh, have not done. The guy's got more comments in here than he's got actual code. See, so look at that. Page, this and that. I'm going to call the random.pi. So someone smarter than me wrote something in Python, and I want to use it. That's the, that's the scenario here. And I'm just going to say Python create runtime and say use file. And I'm using this new 
keyword called dynamic. And I asked somebody, what exactly is this type? It's not var. We've seen var before, right? Var a equals something. And the compiler figures it out. So at compilation time, the type var gets turned into an int or whatever. So I said, what is the dynamic type? And he says, oh, well, it's something dynamic. It's just statically typed as dynamic. brain explodes. What do you mean it's, it's statically typed? We have to tell .NET ahead of time that this is something that's dynamic, but statically. So you know how system.object is like this baked in fundamental thing? Well, system.dynamic object is also. Here we're, we're saying that this is something I just can't tell you about right now, but you'll know later. So I hover over it, it says represents an object whose operations will be resolved at runtime. Okay. So then I'm thinking to myself, well, this is not good, considering that without Google and IntelliSense, I'm not a programmer. Uh, so I'm going to like push dot and hope something happens. Oh, crap. This operation will be resolved at runtime. And then this gets into all the arguments that people have about static versus dynamic languages, right? And people say, oh, well, you know, I really want to know, but the, comp the compiler is going to tell me ahead of time if the thing's going to work or not. And then I was talking to somebody. It might have been Uncle Bob. I don't know. He's very wise. So let's just say it was Uncle Bob. So I'm talking to Uncle Bob, and I say, well, this, uh, this isn't good. I'm not going to know if this is going to work until later. Right? And she says, well, where are your tests? Right? Well, I don't really need my tests. I have a compiler, and the compiler is going to tell me whether this is going to work or not. But in this case, it can't, because the shuffle method is in the Python library. We won't know if this works until that file random.py is found, and then we dynamically dispatch that. So then he says, the compiler is just the first unit test. That's some deep stuff. It's true. All the compiler is doing is it's doing spell check. Right? It's the red squiggly line in Word. It's not the uh, green squiggly line that tells you if it's good grammar. It just says that, yes, you spelled it right. You can put all sorts of words that mean nothing together in Word, uh, and it'll say, yeah, that's cool, no red squiggly lines. But until someone actually reads it, that's your unit test, you're not going to know. So in this case, I, that made me feel less bad about what was going on. Ultimately, though, I realized that I can't do anything other than guess. So I'll run this once, and then we'll put something in that's not the word shuffle, because I know that there's a method called shuffle in the Python library. So I know this will work. And we'll see what happens if I put something else in. Loading random.py. So and then, oh, where'd my console.read line go? Oh, I put in a, I typed a key already. Hey, look at that. The power of .NET. It's random numbers. Thank God I had Python to make this table of random numbers. I don't know what I would have done. Let's say uh, shuffle.poop. Or random.poop. There we go. Script does not contain a definition for poop. All right, now I know. It doesn't know at the time of compile. Okay? Now let's go see something even more interesting, applying this to something like, uh, like com. Because for me, at least, I'm much more likely to do something like this in, uh, you know, like do something with com or Word or Excel than I am uh, Python, for me at least. I don't know. I'm not thinking I'm going to bust out Python all the time. Let me show you this real quick. So this is how we could call an, uh, an object now. Get calculator, calculator calc. I know the type. I know the return value. I know the method. I know everything ahead of time, okay? That's how you do the same thing in reflection. Right? We've done this before. You get the type, invoke member, and you see where it says, quote, add? In the past, that string, the name of the method, was passed in as a string. Because that was the only way you could do it to get the compiler to back off. I could do it like this as a script object. That's a little friendlier way of doing things. But I'm still putting in that add as a, um, as a string. Look how nice this dynamic is compared to the top. All I'm saying is I don't know the type or the method until runtime. But everything else is done. 
the same way. So I statically type to be dynamic. The invocation is dynamic. The conversion of the output value is dynamic. So it's really nice. So we can apply this to things like com and reflection, and it's a lot friendlier syntax. It's doing the same thing. So who here has ever done like um, office automation or Word and Excel and stuff like that? Yeah, I've, I'm sorry for you, the six of you that have actually done this before. It, it's a problem because you need a thing called an interop assembly, which is, uh, and sometimes they're called PIAs, primary interop assembly, which is funny because in the States, PIA means pain in the ass. So if somebody says, yeah, it's a PIA. An interop assembly? No. This is a layer between .NET and COM that makes all of the automation stuff in Word and Excel and all the different things look friendly. They can be really big. They can be 20, 30 megs that you have to carry around. You have to make sure that they're there. They do this translation. For every single interface and structure in COM, there has to be a parallel copied .NET version. Makes this kind of stuff uh, a huge problem. So we have the notion of type equivalence. We can embed just the interop assembly that you're going to use, whether it be Word or any COM interop assembly that you decide to use. And then the runtime will figure out that the type that you've embedded is in fact the same type. So if it sees two types, one that I have and then one that I come upon, so oh well, he's got Microsoft.Word.Application, it's the same, they line up, no more type mismatches. So this here is just a little C-sharp application that's a lot simpler than uh, your typical apps to say, make uh, an Excel app. I'm going to go and get my processes on my machine. I'm going to get the ones that are using the most memory. And then for each of those processes, we're just going to put, a, sl put a, sh a slot in Excel, and then we'll make a chart. This example here is an interesting one, this syntax where we're saying after colon, there are a lot of options when you have these com interfaces. Typically when you're doing this you have to go null comma null comma null comma null comma something comma null comma null comma null and you go on and on and on. You can see how many of them there are. That's really ugly. So in C sharp you get named parameters. You can just say the parameter that you mean by name and all the other ones are going to default to null which is pretty cool. And then we'll copy it to Word and we'll paste it in. Okay? So we'll get the processes, we'll bring up Word, we'll make a chart, we'll take the chart, we'll put it in the clipboard, we'll pop it into, into Word. Yay. But if I bring that up in Reflector and see what's really going on, look at the references. I can see I've got a reference to these two interop assemblies. And inside them is all this crap, which is just interop garbage. It goes on forever. So I wasn't even able to resolve that. I have to go hunting for where it is. I don't want to carry these DLLs around. I need them if I'm going to get anything done. What I want to do is I want to go over here to my references, pick these two, say properties, and say embed interop types. Then I'll build it. I'll go back over here to Reflector and I'll do a refresh. The references are gone, but where are they? Well, since we know what we used, we just copied in the little bits that we needed. So instead of the 30 megs of interop, I just pulled in the charts and a little couple of things that I called, brought them in in the same namespace, and then at runtime, it'll figure out that, oh, well, he's talking about an Office Interop Excel chart. That's the same as the Office Interop Excel chart that I already know about. So we've got two things here. One is the embedding of COM Interop stuff, which makes doing COM Interop work for legacy systems a lot easier. And the second thing is the runtime equivalence is a lot easier. So if you're doing any work in, um, in legacy systems that involve COM, that, that is a huge change, and that's all built into 4 .0. Now, do you guys have this guy? He speaks English or Norwegian? English. English. So he goes, get off my lawn! Yeah! Is that what he says here? Something like that? Kind of sounds like that? Um, this is the crotchety old guy, and you may notice if you're on Twitter, if someone says, get off my lawn! That's just the typical thing that an old dude would say. 
I, I, I recently caught these seven-year-olds trying to kick my fence down, and they were throwing rocks, and they had just painted the fence, and they were kicking the, the slats of the fence, and I jumped over the fence, and I ran after them. They were like seven, so they were really fast. And, uh, and I told my, my friend about it, and he listened very patiently, and I told him the story, and I, you know, I was acting it out with a whole cast of characters and explaining how I leapt over like Neo in the Matrix and stuff when really I hurt my back. And at the end of it, he just looked at me and he said, yeah, get off my lawn, huh, old man? So he made me feel pretty good. A lot of people who might see this stuff in 4.0, they might say, oh, God, you know, 2.0 was good enough for me. Uh, my you know, kids today with your fancy .NET, they may feel that 4.0 is coming and I've got to relearn a whole bunch of stuff. What a hassle that is. Well, it turns out that 4.0 doesn't automatically roll things forward. And this is a good thing. When you put 4.0 on your machine, your old apps still run on 3.5. You have to put a switch in to say that your app can roll forward if appropriate. But this is good because we're not going to change stuff. We're not going to move your cheese. Your cheese is going to be exactly where you left it. This is a very compatible release. It's more compatible than the 1.0 to 2.0 change. So chances are things are going to work. But rather than taking any chances, it doesn't auto-roll forward, which is a good thing. We should have, make the old man inside you very happy. We felt that the best thing was to prefer the version of the framework that you compiled on. Okay? If you have an application and you want to test it, you can email these guys here and say, well, I have an app and I'd like to test it and I'd like to give it to you. Not the source code, just the binaries. And they'll add it to the compatibility lab so that your company's application could be tested. And if you want more information on that, you can certainly email me. So in CLR2, you may have written add-ins for either um, Explorer or for Outlook, and those things live in that host process. But because 3.5 and 3.0 and 2.0 are all the same thing, uh, that wasn't a big deal. You could tell your boss, yeah, 3.5 and 2.0, they run side by side fine. But if you wanted to load 1.1 into the same process space, you can't do it, right? You only get one CLR per process. So that sucks. With CLR 4, inside of something like Explorer or Outlook, you can actually have 4.0 add-ins and 2.0 add-ins side by side in the same process space. Which if you make add-ins for a living, or your company does, this will make sure that things won't break. As a user, you can have your existing 2.0 stuff running in Outlook or Explorer and your 4.0 add-ins that come out are not going to break, which is a really good thing. And that's the little clip art dude that says, whoo, and we don't like him, so we'll do that. <laughs> this is good because it's side by side, always together, never apart. You know, you see them all the time. How can we demo that in the remaining time? Inside of my side by side folder here, and I'm actually going to open up a command prompt here. Ah, D drive. There we go. All right. I've got a couple of things going on here. Let's see what we can do. I've got this v2 managed com DLL, okay? And I've got a v4 managed app. So I've got some existing com component that's inside of my, it was written in .NET 2, the way you used to write add-ins, right? Um, we can start here by just saying CLR ver. I actually didn't even know that this file, this existed. You guys know that CLR ver exists? That happens now. You can use that now. No idea. Isn't it creepy when some dude at a presentation types something from the command line and you go, whoa, I didn't know that existed. I like to, do, I like to push F7 just to freak people out, and it usually gets about 10% of the people. They go, whoa, when did they add that? Is that Windows 7? It's like, no, dude, DOS 4. Just do that really fast, right? It's like giving a talk and then suddenly busting this out. Woo! Oh my God, is that added? No, that's not new. Um, yeah, CLR ver, get to know it. It's good stuff. If you type CLR ver, that's cool, but if you type CLR ver slash all, this is interesting. Check it out. Shows you the processes on your system right now that are currently using .NET and what version. That's hot, right? Fiddler's 2.0, Reflector's 2.0. Okay, that makes sense. That's shiny. Um, let's run our v4 managed app. Okay. There he is right there at the bottom. And then I'm going to hit activate. This 
message box here is a .NET 2 message box. That process has both CLRs running inside it. So that's cool. Let's run Snippet Compiler. Snippet Compiler is an old .NET 2.0 application. And there it is. Okay. But I've also got in my directory this guy, Open Command Shell. This is a plugin for Explorer that lets you right click on a folder and open up a command shell. And we've got lots of little utilities like this on our machines. I'm going to open up the common dialog here in, um, in Snippet Compiler. I'm going to right click on it. And you see my open command prompt is here. OK? And I'll leave that open. Snippet Compiler, a 2.0 app that doesn't know anything about 4.0, now has 4.0 running because my open command prompt DLL was written in 4.0. So this is going to be really good stuff for plug-in people for Outlook, for, for, Excel, uh, for um, Explorer, that you can do these things. And in this case here, my 4.0 existing uh, Explorer add-on didn't break my 2.0 app when the CLR got loaded into memory. So that's cool. And that's side-by-side -side CLR. And that's built in, too. So I think I'm out of time. That's all that I've got. Uh, please follow me on Twitter if you want to hear about my kids and just how my digestion is going. It's really nothing technical, so you don't expect, have very low expectations of me on Twitter. I think those of you who follow me on Twitter can probably attest to it. Uh, and feel free to email me if you have any questions. Uh, I've also got a talk after this. The next talk in 15 minutes is called uh, Making Your Blog Suck Less. It's going to be techniques on using social networking to be a better developer and how to have a more successful blog. And then later this afternoon, Phil and I, uh, Phil Ha and Scott Ha are going to have the Ha Ha Brothers, and we're going to talk about security on the web using ASP.NET MVC. And then tomorrow afternoon, I've got Astoria. So we'll, sh we'll look at that, that JSON endpoint in a lot more detail over the course of an hour. Uh, and that's all I got. Thank you very much. And uh, if you guys, if anyone has any questions uh, while you're kind of filing in or out, if you want to hang, I'll hang out as long as you hang out. I've got 15 minutes till my next talk starts. So feel free to call out some questions and I'll answer the best that I can. Or not. Just don't say anything. <laughs> Stay right there. <laughs>